A continuación, Aaron Ploetz nos platica sobre la propuesta de Data Stacks para resolver el problema de lograr aplicaciones dinámicas con alto desempeño mediante bases de datos distribuidas geográficamente. Um, I'd like to take you through a, a little talk I have called um, Solving the Distributed Data Problem. Uh, this, is, this is actually based on an article that I wrote for uh, CIO Magazine a, a couple of years ago. But, um, you know, the, the whole idea is that there, there's all this data out there And, you know, as, as businesses, we're, we're trying to get our customers the data that's relevant to them no matter where they are. And that's, uh, that's our goal here today, to talk about that. And that's, that's essentially it. It's, it's, we have all this data, uh, but there's only a little bit of it that our customers want, and how do we get it to them? And of course, our customers are spread, you know, for a lot of places all over the world. Um, so this is about, you know, again, How do we make it so that their data is local to where they're working? So a, uh, a little about me. Um, my name is Aaron Pletz. Um, I'm a developer advocate uh, for data stacks. Um, I'm also an author, you know, when I, when I have time. Um, uh, Jesus, actually, who's uh, one of the organizers for this event, um, told me that he uses my seven NoSQL databases in a week book to teach his, uh, his, his university class. I, I was very honored by that. <laughs> that that's pretty cool. Um, but, um, you know, I, I work a lot in the Apache Cassandra open source database community. Um, I actually run a, uh, a pod, the official podcast for it as well. You know, so we, we have people on and talk about uh, Cassandra and working with large scale data on a distributed level. So, so yeah. Uh, let's see here. Oh, yes, and I have another book that's coming out uh, probably by the end of the year. It's called Code with Java 21. Still work in progress. But, um, you know, Java 21 is going to be the next LTS release. So um, this one is actually really cool with, like, you know, if you're a Java nerd like I am, you know, where you have, like, a, you know, Java 21 will have, like, uh, virtual threads and, you know, a few other really cool features as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I, I think... Uh, Raid, who, who spoke first this morning, put it best when he said, you don't want me trying to speak Spanish up here. It's better for us all if, if, I, if I do not. And um, I, I needed Google Translate to say that. So, <laughs> so if, if you all bear with me, this is, um, yes, that, that's, the, that's the extent of the, the Spanish I've had. Um, I had it two years in high school, actually. And then I spent the last two weeks on Duolingo, and it's, it's not good enough. No. So... <laughs> Anyway, um, data, data is everywhere, um, and every day, and in fact, I think uh, Felipe, who was the, the last speaker up, talked about how much data is out there, uh, along with the projection that, uh, that by, what did he say, by 2025, there will be 180 zettabytes of data out there. There's just, that's a crazy amount. Um, you know, so every day, There are more than 300 billion emails that get sent. Oh, do I have to be close enough for it to... Oh, there it goes, okay. <laughs> There are, I'll have to remember not to walk too far over on, on this side of the stage, I, I guess. But um, there are 24 billion text messages sent. And yeah, I double checked that, because you think more people send text messages than they do emails these days, but so many emails are automated And so many are, are spam that the, the figure for emails related to text messages is still so much higher. Ah, now I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, <laughs> eight and a half billion Google searches every single day. That's, that's an insane number. That's, that, that's quite a bit. It tells you how much as professionals, as, as citizens, we all kind of rely on Google to, uh, to give us good information. And of course, There are more than 1.5 billion hours of Netflix streamed around the world every single day. Everyone here watch Netflix? I do. Yeah, yeah. I, I see a couple of hands going up. Yeah, yeah. We all love our shows on Netflix. <laughs> um, so, of course, data leads us to revenue. Uh, because, again, as, as businesses, as, as enterprise corporations, this is really what, really what we're driving for. Um, The video streaming industry has a market revenue of about, in 2022, a little more than $30 billion. Um, and we, we mentioned Netflix already, but that's here. Also Disney Plus, 
HBO Max. Um, there's, yeah, there's a, a lot of money to be made in video streaming, as we all know. Uh, the video game industry is more than 90, did more than $97 billion um, US uh, worth of revenue last year. And that's, you know, like Xbox, Steam, Activision, uh, PlayStation. Um, for, for people like me who are in their, their late 40s, you know, you probably remember the old Activision games that came out on Atari 2600. So Activision has been at it for a very, very long time. Um, and of course, worldwide e-commerce, um, 5.7 trillion US dollars last year, more than. Um, you know, and that's your, you know, places like Walmart, Best Buy, Amazon, anywhere you're buying online, that's, that's worldwide e-commerce right there. So there's a lot of data out there. There's a lot of revenue around it. And there's a, there's a lot of efficiencies to be had by taking a look at how, to make, at how to make these little adjustments that can help your customers. And of course, what kills it all? What makes it all, what makes it all difficult to do? Latency. Latency is really, you know, as, um, as tech folks, whether you're working in infrastructure, or software development, um, or your database administrator, latency is your enemy. And that's what, what we all are, are trying to work to negate. So who's been to a website and seen something like this? Uh, you know, as, as customers, do we, do we like seeing websites like this? No. <laughs> um, you know, and then if, then if you're lucky after a little while, maybe you see that, and then that. And then that, and then maybe that and that. Ah, no, I went too fast. <laughs> um, but the idea is, is that the, what you don't want is for your customers to be ha having to wait, having to watch, having to watch your site, you know, come in piece by piece like it's 1999 again. Um, it's, it's definitely not uh, not something you want. There we go. Okay. <laughs> um, so of course, latency is what make th makes things slow. And there's a lot of places that latency can happen. Um, but the thing is, and the important thing to remember is that when customers have to wait, that's when they leave. Um, you know, Google Marketplace says that 40% of users, you know, will, will leave after only three seconds of waiting. Um, there are some sources that say that that can even be low as 400 milliseconds. Um, now that's not even a half a second, but you know, if, if it's enough time for someone to look at an app and see like a blank space where something should be, that's enough for them to start thinking about what other applications do I have on my phone that do the same thing I'm trying to do? And it's enough to get them to start thinking about jumping to a different app and abandoning yours. Um, so that's ultimately what we don't want. So latency numbers every programmer should know. And yes, I have a QR code on there. Um, if you want to go to the site where, uh, you know, it kind of lays all this out. Um, I promised I wouldn't get too technical, but, um, you know, this, this is just, this is just um, some information that's kind of fun. Like, reading one megabyte of data from a spinning disk, you know, a hard disk drive, takes about a half a millisecond. Um, but that's not counting the two milliseconds of seek time it is while you wait for the platters to spin around and match up with the write head, or read head for that matter. Um, solid state is a massive improvement over that. You know, we're looking at 24 microseconds. Um, you know, when you, when you look at cloud offerings, like, um, you know, going, going to AWS and, and spinning, up a, uh, spinning up an instance and, and choosing your disk, um, picking solid state drives might be more expensive, but that's a big advantage um, over something that's, uh, that's still built on a spinning disk. And then, of course, you got your network pings. Um, network is really where a lot of latency is lost. Um, and in this particular case, I, I think the, um, I used California and Europe, but it was like, um, I think it was San Francisco to Amsterdam, and it was uh, 150 milliseconds. Now that's just a ping time, right? That's starting here, going there, coming back. That's not talking about querying any data or, or building a, a result set to pull something back meaningful. That's a trip that's straight there and straight back. Um, and maybe a more, relevant example for some of the folks in this room is network ping time from Mexico City down to Sao Paulo, Brazil is 160 milliseconds. Um, you wouldn't think so because they're, I mean, I, I don't feel like they're very far away, but you know, that's, uh, that's the reality of the situation. 
All right, so it becomes our goal to cut down latency and, and do what we can. So it's always a good idea. You know, you, I'm sure you've heard about using a CDN, you know, content delivery network. Um, you know, things like, things like Fastly, um, you know, to, to go ahead and serve some of your images, some of your content, keep it cached. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot to be said for doing that. Like good, concise, well-running code and keeping images small, that's, that's huge. But the other thing that a lot of places fail to take into consideration is co-locating services with their data. Um, that's, a, that's a huge one, you know, especially when you consider that you, know, you can be talking 100 plus milliseconds just to actually get to another cloud region or another data center that, that might have your database. Um, so that co-location becomes very important. Um, and really, with that last point, kind of what it drives home is that it's a great idea, you know, when you're, you're building out or when you're, use it, you're choosing a, um, like a real-time data platform, you want to make sure you pick one that's geographically aware. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that in a second. But, um, you know, there are data stores out there which can be programmed, which can be configured to, say, have some knowledge about where they are. Um, oh, hey, I'm over in US East 1. Well, I have a counterpart in US West 1 that I want to make sure I, I keep in sync with. It's, it's about having that, um, that topology awareness. All right, so that brings us to Datastax Astra. Um, and the thing is, is that, um, is that at, with Datastax Astra, we've really tried to make this easy for you to do. Um, Datastax Astra DB is probably our, our core component, and it's built on open source Apache Cassandra, um, which, is, which is, again, you know, I have a slide on it in a second, but it's one of the more prolific databases being used out there in the world to support large-scale distributed data. Then there's Apa um, Datastax Astra Streaming, which is built on top of Apache Pulsar. So this is for, you know, your data that um, is like event streaming, is publish, subscribe, um, it kind of works as like a serverless message broker. Um, for those of you familiar with Kafka, Pulsar is kind of the same thing, except it's, uh, it's designed to be cloud native. You know, it's des designed to, um, again, kind of have that, that region awareness that, um, that a lot of systems out there lack. And then, of course, you know, a, p a new piece to our, our platform, uh, we recently purchased a company called Cascada. Um, it's a real-time AI ML tool set um, lets you build in like a uh, you know like a, like a feature store into your into your data as well. Um, so that's uh, that's something that uh, again we've kind of integrated into our platform a bit, um, and it's all out there on um, all three major cloud providers. All right, so a little focus on AstroDB here. You know I mentioned that um, it was built on open source Apache Cassandra, um, which is a NoSQL database. It's highly available, works at very very large scale. Um, actually, you know, the, the largest deployment of Cassandra that's out there right now is at, uh, is at Apple. So, you know, if, if you use any of Apple services, you have an iPhone, um, you're going to, um, your, you know, your iCloud, um, using iMusic, it's all going through Cassandra. Um, again, it's also region aware, and it's been doing region awareness for, for more, for the better part of a decade. So it's been doing it for a very long time. And Cassandra is also used by 90% of the, uh, the Fortune 100. Um, so it's, it's, it's one of those things, you know, like when my family asks what I do, you know, and they, they're like, well, what is Cassandra? And I'm like, well, you know, <laughs> you probably use Cassandra every day and you don't even know it. That's the best way that I can explain it to, uh, to my family. No, anyway. Um, so quick question in the room. How many of you have heard of Apache Cassandra? Oh, hey, I got one. Oh, okay, a few. Excellent, excellent. Anybody act actively using it right now? Uh, that's a no. Okay. All right. No, no, no. That's good. That's good. <laughs> All right. Um, remember this slide? I talked about this a, a couple of minutes ago, but um, all of the companies mentioned on this slide have extremely large Cassandra deployments. Um, and of course, you know, the, the one that I'm going to focus on today, the one that, that, um, has a lot of public information about how they use Cassandra um, is Netflix. And of course, you know, we're talking about Netflix a lot today. But um, 
you know, they have a they have 22,000 Cassandra nodes or server instances, you know, running, and um, it's across 900 clusters. Netflix has 12 petabytes of data, and using Cassandra, they can support about 13 million operations a second. Um, and of course, they can do this because they have you know logical data centers spread around the world. Actually, I mean, Netflix kind of started out as just a U.S. thing, but um, I mean, you can even you can watch Netflix in um, Ant Antarctica now. I think <laughs> so. It's uh, it's that prolific. But um, DataStax AstroDB again, think of it as kind of kind of managed Cassandra. Um, it's available on you know AWS. Uh, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform. Um, and we have a very robust free tier as well if you just want to try it out. Very easy to use. Um, data replication across 30 cloud regions. Um, no sysadmin work. Again, it's fully managed, database as a service. Uh, we take out the, the hard part for you. And has no touch auto scaling. So of course I get asked a lot, um, you know, well, what is, what is scaling? You know, a lot of folks, um, you know, kind of have that question. And it, it's important to talk real quick about database scaling. So really what it is, is that when you find your database kind of being pressed for resources, that, um, you know, it's a, it's a way to get it to handle larger workloads. And there are traditionally two ways of, um, of scaling a database. And one is known as vertical scaling. And vertical scaling is pretty simple. It's, you know, it's adding more disk, it's adding more RAM, it's, Oh, that CPU was supposed to be, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> it's, um, you know, it's essentially adding more resources onto an already existing server or machine. The problem, though, is you run into a limit on that. You know, there's only so much RAM, only so much disk that um, your motherboard will address. And once you reach that, you're, you're, kind, of, you're kind of stuck. Um, so the approach that we take with DataStax AstroDB is that we use something called horizontal scaling. So if we have one machine instance that's getting overloaded, well, we can add a second one. And if those two machines aren't enough, we can add a third, and we can add a fourth, and so on and so on. Um, I, I used to work for, uh, for Target in uh, the US, which uh, has like you know, 2,000 stores. They're a big retailer. Um, we had a Cassandra footprint of about 11,000 nodes, um, you know, doing things like um, you know, pricing and drive up and adding things to your cart on target.com. That's all back at Cassandra. Um, anyway, so how can Astra help you solve your data problems? So quick example for you here. You know, let's assume that you have a, uh, an online business. Um, maybe you have uh, customers down in Miami. And if you're lucky, you have a lot of customers down in Miami. Um, so, you know, these customers have your app on their phone. And you know that app, of course, is backed by a microservice layer, which if your customers are in Miami, well, it makes sense to make sure you're putting your microservice layer down here too. And a microservice layer needs a data layer. So that, of course, makes sense. Well, we want to make sure we, we have, we're doing co-location, right? Have our, have our database layer next to our microservice layer. All right, easy enough. Well, what happens when you maybe get a customer or, or a few up in Vancouver? Um, then we're talking, it's, it's, it's a little trickier, you know? So then you think about this and like, well, all right, I can put a, a microservice layer up on the, um, you know, way on the Northwest coast there. Um, but depending on your database choice, that microservice layer is making that 70 plus millisecond call for data down to Miami, which again, it doesn't sound like much, but when you're, when you're, Building, the, but again, remember this is just that's the trip there and back. That's the ping, you know, to go ahead and pull data, to pull meaningful data, and assemble a result set, and then send that back is actually quite a bit more. So, the solution is to go ahead and replace that. You know, DataStax AstroDB can be deployed down there in the uh, you know uh, region that's uh, local to Miami, um, and you can also have your cluster span to another region that's up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and then your customers with, you, with your app are talking to your microservices and your data and it's all co-located, it all cuts down that latency. Now, you still have data replication, which will have that latency between um, you know, the different cloud regions. Um, but kind of the, the nice thing about that is that it can still serve requests. 
um, it can still, it'll, it'll actually mask that latency from your customer. So basically with replication, any write happening in Miami, I mean, or in Vancouver for that matter, is getting replicated over to the other data center. Um, this way your mobile and web customers, you know, they have that proximity to their microservice layer, to their database. Um, and customers, they don't notice that inter-region latency because it's being handled at the database level. It's being abstracted away from them. Um, yeah, and of course, each region in DC can be scaled independently. And this is key because, you know, despite my, uh, my stick figures <laughs> that I, I put up there, you may have more customers in Miami than you do up in Vancouver, and that, um, you won't want the same level or the same amount of compute resources actually in both data centers. You know, you'll want it so that it's, it's appropriately scaled to what the workloads are. Um, and in this way, you actually save a, a quite a bit of money by making sure you have an appropriately scaled um, resources you know, behind your, behind your uh, app. All right, real quick, Astra streaming. Um, you know, again, backed on open source Apache Pulsar. Um, it's event streaming, uh, publish, subscribe, um, serverless broker, message queue. Um, remember, if you're building up a you're building up a queue of anything, that's you usually really don't want to do that in a database. You want to make sure you're using a product that's uh, specifically designed for that. Um, ah, you get exactly once uh, message delivery, which is which is really really good. Um, and the thing about you know Astra Streaming is that it's also region aware, so it has that awareness of which regions it's operating in and which ones it has to keep in sync with. So a good example of why you might use a, uh, an event streaming product is if, um, you know, let's say that you're supporting, you know, kind of going back to our, our website example, um, let's say that we're supporting like um, multiple order statuses. So we have like pending orders, picked orders, shipped orders, completed orders. Um, so if we have a customer who is on our website and places an order, that order is going to go to the pending topic, right? Well. What happens then is, um, you know, you're, uh, the, the people in the warehouse get a notification that there's a pending, top, pending order out there. They pull it down and, uh, you know, they send someone out in a forklift or they send a robot out, you know, to kind of go around and pull, pull the items down. Um, and then when they come back, they can move that order from pending to picked because those, those uh, items have been picked. And then what happens is those items go over to the packaging department, takes those items, puts them in a box, wraps it up, tapes it, puts it on a conveyor belt, and then they mark it as shipped. And then the shipping department gets a hold of it and uh, puts it on a truck, and maybe somewhere along the way it ends up on an airplane, um, but then it ends up on another truck, and eventually arrives at your front door, the delivery person takes out the package, puts it on your doorstep, you know, they do their little snap the picture of it, and um, then, Kind of, kind of, that kind of um, hit their device and say, "Hey, this order is completed." Um, so this is something that you could really use, you know, um, like an event stream processor for, like like DataStax uh, Astra Streaming, which, um, you know, again, will we'll make sure that not only is nothing lost, but nothing's duplicated. You get that exact, exactly once delivery guarantee. Um, yeah. All right. So moving on, you know, when you're building out your applications. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can go about it. There's a lot of, lot of um, standards and protocols out there. Uh, we actually offer a wide range of um, API options. Um, you know, if you're, if you're already, and this is in terms of talking with um, or communicating with, uh, you know, AstroDB, but if you're already using Cassandra, you know, we have the Cassandra API. Um, if, you're, if you've used a lot of GraphQL, uh, we, we, have, we have an API for that as well. Um, you know, we also have RESTful endpoints that get automatically built out to, out to expose certain areas of, um, of your tables and your, your data infrastructure. Um, and there's also a document API as well as um, Google's gRPC, which, uh, you know, is kind of a recent development, but, uh, but yeah. And then, of course, if you're working on a, an event streaming project, there's a lot of options out there for that, too, as far as um, communicating with, um, you know, Astra Streaming. If you're already using Pulsar, that's easy. If you're already using Kafka, do we have any Kafka users in here? Yeah? Yeah? Oh yeah, all right, a couple, yeah. Um, if you're already using Kafka, it's, you can actually tie right up to Astra Streaming without any code changes, it's pretty simple. 
All right, but the idea is, is that you know, we've done a lot of the hard work to try and make this easy for you, to make it easy to put your apps out there and make sure that you're, you're getting data to your customers that they want, that's relevant to them, and to really allow you to pick the way to work with it that makes the most sense for you. Um, so I have a couple of predictions, and this goes back to uh, the, you know, the article I wrote, but um, you know, essentially, single instance data services will become a thing of the past. Now, you know, we traditionally relational databases have, you know, were, were built, you know, to be, you know, kind of assuming that they'd be in that, that one server kind of architecture. But, um, but even today, you know, you can, you see things out there like, um, you know, MS SQL Server has things like, um, has like failover capabilities. Um, there's even like an HA Postgres that you can get as well, you know, if you're, if you're using Postgres. You know, so, so even the relational databases are starting to become multiple instance. Um, so really, in 10 years, I don't think we'll see anyone running a single instance database anywhere. And lastly, I think we're going to see more data platforms, more data products, starting to build out region awareness. Because this is such an important concept for, um, you know, for, for data platforms to have and to understand, um, just, in, just in terms of making sure that you're getting the value that you need out of it, and again, getting data to your customers that matters to them. All right. Um, so really, if uh, you have any questions or anything, you know, we'd, we'd love to you know, talk to you over at the DataStacks booth. Um, but just you know, a final thought, I'd like to leave you with, hey, you, know, you want to get your data to your customers, and at, at DataStacks, we can help you do that. Um, so, muchas gracias, and uh, thank you very much.